This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. My guest today is Paul Hofford. He is the co-founder of the legendary Canadian rock band Lighthouse, and he joins us today to talk about his latest project, which is a documentary titled The Rhapsody, which tells the astonishing story of composer Leo Spellman, a Polish Holocaust survivor who later emigrated to Toronto, who set out on a riveting and emotional journey towards artistic liberation at the age of 98. The documentary presents Spellman's musical masterpiece composed in a German DP camp, which was lost for over 40 years alongside his secret wartime diary. July 23rd, 1944. It is more than one year since we escaped from the ghetto. The soldiers have arrived in town and are looking for places to stay. We are living through desperate times. Welcome, Paul Hofford. It's nice to see you. Nice to chat with you again. Congratulations to you and and to everyone involved in the Rhapsody. It is an outstanding documentary, riveting from beginning right through to the end. Thank you very much. It's been a long haul, and when we started the documentary, it was a much uh, uh, less ambitious, uh, smaller but exciting project uh, that ballooned into uh, what it is today, which is a, a, a much more sophisticated and uh, high production value with animation and everything. Yeah. started out that I got a cold call from this guy, um, Leo Spellman, yeah. who had written a piece of music here in the music business like I am, and you record people's music and conduct it and do that kind of stuff. Uh, this is what happens. And he said, uh, you know, have a piece of music. Uh, I understand that you uh, you conduct orchestras and go in recording studios, and I'd like to have it recorded. He said, are you the Paul Hoffert that, that does that sort of stuff? I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. He said, okay, you're, you're, my, you're my man. So... Uh, <laughs> I met uh, I met Leo. He invited me to his house to audition me, audition me to see if, if I'd be good enough. Okay. To, I went, when was the last time my, you went for an audition? It was a while ago. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, I always respect any any creator's work, and uh, and uh, I was amazed that the, uh, the the musical work that he played for me, which uh, he called Rhapsody, nineteen thirty nine, nineteen forty five. That gave me a little clue, 1939, 1945, World War II, Nazis. And um, and he said it had, uh, he had forgotten about it for 45 years after he wrote it. And it had a performance in, uh, in Europe right after the war, right after he wrote it as kind of his musical diary of what had happened. And people liked it a lot. And uh, then... 55 years later, in the year 2000, so Leo Spellman, who phoned me, was 98 years old when he called me. Right? Wow. And he said, okay, so he said, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. was having its 10th anniversary, and they had heard that I wrote this piece of music that came up to Canada. I had forgotten about it. We looked and we found an old suitcase that had some parts. And they uh, performed it in Washington, D.C. And the next year, they performed it in New York City. It was a big hit, big success for a piece of classical music. Very unusual for a living composer. Uh, and then the next year, it got another performance in the United States. And then Leo told me, he said, my grandkids are saying, um, 
he said, you know, when after the war I came to Toronto and he said, you know, there's no work for a classical composer and a classical pianist because all the classical composers and pianos coming to North America and there was no work for any of them. Mm -hmm. So um, my friend said, uh, you got to do something more accessible and more popular. So he said, I changed my name from Leon Spielmann. He said, Spielmann means a guy that plays. Right. He said, I come from a dynasty of musicians in Europe. He said, my cousin... Uh, Vladislav Spielmann was uh, the subject of a movie by um, that was uh, in, in 2000. It won the uh, Oscar for Best Award and the Palme d'Or and all that kind of stuff. So he said he was very famous and I'm famous and my father and my grandfather and all this kind of stuff. So I said, let me hear it. He said, well, that's the problem. He said, um, all I have is a really, a, a very, very low quality little uh, uh, video, uh, audio cassette. He said, have you seen those? I said, yeah, I have. He said, uh, and um, he said, my grandkids say that they always knew me as an orchestra leader. I had a dance band in Toronto. The Leo, he said, I changed my name to Leo Spellman because it didn't sound so European. Mm -hmm. And he said, for 30 or 40 years, I had the, the number one sort of uh, event and dance band uh, orchestra in Toronto, which he did, Leo Spellman Orchestra. So my kids and grandkids knew me by that, but he said they now I'm starting to get uh, recognized as a as a classical composer. They want to make a good quality recording. Can you help me do that? He said I it's the it's only 12 minutes long, but I, I want to make it about a half hour long, so it'll be easier to program with an orchestra. And he said, um, uh, you know, my my eyes are starting to get a little bad now. He said I'm 98. He said I, I was driving till last year. He was 97. <laughs> but he said, now I don't see so good. He says, so you can help me put in some uh, some extra music. And um, anyway, that was it. So that's how it all started out. And he started coming over to my house twice a week. And I'd pick him up in the morning. And um, he was in fantastic shape. Fantastic shape physically, mentally, very alert. Yeah. Musically, off the charts. So we started working on stuff and I would mock up sections on my computer, uh, you know, before we got into the recording studio to make sure, you know, he approved everything. And, um, you know, he'd say, oh, the violin line over there. That's not, uh, that's not, I want a little slower. So it's not so fast. So there it goes, da, 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 and on and on. And, um, and I loved him. We, we, became, we became fantastic friends. As we started working on this little project, um, uh, our son, David Hoffert, who some people may know from different things, he's a, a, a documentarian, yeah. uh, made uh, document, documents for National Film Board last year, won lots of awards around the world, he made 400 television programs that he, that he produced and edited. And our wife, my wife, Brenda, mm -hmm. met Leo just in my house. And they found what I found. He had a magnetic personality. He was a larger than life guy that once he opened the door and walked into a room, he was holding court. And they asked him a little bit about his, his music and his background. And um, they said, has anybody ever uh, gotten you on film, National Film Board, CBC, you know, maybe the Shoah Foundation, you know, Steven Spielberg's thing. And he said, no, um, I, I never wanted to talk about my experiences when I wrote this. They're too painful for me. So David and Brenda and I decided to make a little documentary. That was the germ of our documentary. And we thought what the documentary will be about is this guy wrote a piece of music, which, as I found out, was a great piece of music. It was lost for 55 years. It was rediscovered by the U.S. Memorial Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with my assistance, we're going to make a CD of it, a record, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a performance in Canada. And if it, if it all works out, we'll film it all. And this will be a nice little documentary of an uplifting story of an artist who gets rediscovered after all these years. And that's how it got started. Ted Wallachin returns in a moment. 
June is birthday month at Tom's Place. So come celebrate Tom's 66th birthday on June 7th. And that's today is June 9th. And finally, Tom Jr.'s is on the 13th. Throw in Father's Day and Canada Day, and you've got a month-long party, and we know how to celebrate with great birthday deals like 100% wool suits from 166 to 266 selected dress pants and shirts for $66, and selected sports jackets starting at 166 Wish Tom happy birthday on Facebook for a chance to win a $660 shopping spree. Tom's Place will suit you. Hey, let me take a moment to tell you about my friends at Helenda's. They are the meat people. You know, I've been a fan of their products for years now, and without a doubt, they make some of the best sausage in Ontario. They are multiple award winners, having captured the Ontario's finest meat competition's coveted award of excellence on three occasions, in addition to dozens of individual product awards. Hollandez has also received the Grand Champion Ribbon at the past two Royal Winter Fairs ready-to-eat meat snack competitions. So whether you're preparing a charcuterie board or a full-blown sit-down dinner for your friends or family, you'll find Hollandez award-winning products at fine meat shops throughout the province, now including selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland stores, along with their seven Hollandas locations. Their barbecued kielbasa is my favorite. On a fresh bun with horseradish, it is out of this world. But don't just take my word for it. Judge for yourself. On your barbecue, in your kitchen, or straight from the refrigerator. Hollandas, the way sausage should taste. Now back to Ted Wallachin. Theo's stories were amazing in how many times he cheated death. Gut-wrenching stories about being rounded up and put into the ghetto. He was chased by Nazi guards. So one time, this is important, and how I survived this, I don't know. At night, I took a chance. I got out from my hiding place. I went out dressed like a pole, and it was already dark. They couldn't see my nose because they could recognize the nose, your Jewish nose, you know? Now, I had grenades in my pocket, and I had a gun. And suddenly, I heard, halt! And I see this as a soldier. There was no way to get out. I pretend I don't hear, and I start to walk away. In avian, he said, hold! Throw away your gun, or I shoot you. And I run. Paul Hufford is my guest. He's a producer of The Rhapsody. It's the story of uh, Leo Spellman. You talk about Mr. Spellman in the documentary, Paul, and, and how for the longest period of time he didn't want to go back in, and I think the words were he didn't want to go back there, so he blocked it out. He just, which is why he, he one of the reasons, I suppose, we, he, which he chose a different style of music, everything that he had written about was, was so uh, so painful, so hurtful, that even when his daughter talks about it, he says, well, my parents decided they didn't want to live as victims. They wanted to enjoy their life after a war. What do you think it was, was the key for him to decide to go back and, and relive this period of his life? That, that's a terrific question, especially since um, not so much his children, but his grandchildren, uh, who are now in their uh, 20s, uh, uh, kept pestering him to uh, tell his story to them so that the family could know because they were very interested Mm -hmm. in how he became a Holocaust survivor. And so they would try to get a little video camera, home camera, and sit down with him and do this several times. And he absolutely did not (laughs) cooperate with them. That's actually quite funny part of it. And refused to talk about it. Now, this had some resonance with me because... Uh, I'm the son uh, of a Holocaust escaper, and much of my personal family 
uh, was killed. My uncles, my aunts, my cousins, uh, grandparents, everything like that. In Poland, I come, my dad was born in a city that was only about an hour away from where Leo Spellman was born. He was in Ostrowiec, my dad was in Zhezhov. And growing up, uh, my dad would never talk about the experiences, very rarely. Uh, and he was also a guy who was just really glad to be an immigrant and to start a new life. Uh, and he wanted to be assimilated and, uh, and do, about, do that. And uh, I'm not saying that my dad's situation was the same as Leo's, because every, everybody who survived that situation is, is unique. But I did have some experience growing up and not identifying very much as a Jew from the Holocaust and, you know, all that sort of horrible stuff. Mm -hmm. I heard about it occasionally, as anybody hears about it, but it wasn't really. So I could empathize a little bit with his kids and I could empathize with Leo a bit about the fact that he didn't want to talk about it. And the reason was, in particular, for Leo, the situations that he was in in order to survive were uh, so horrific and so terrible that he never wanted to go there in his mind. He didn't want to relive those things. And in fact, his famous cousin, uh, uh, Vladislav Spielmann, uh, you know, who kept his European name, who was the subject of the movie The Pianist, um, after the war, he and Vladislav stayed in touch and Vladislav was not keen either to have Roman Polanski make the movie that eventually won the Oscar. But uh, his kids and his grandkids wanted to very much to uh, memorialize uh, their father and their grandfather. And, uh, and he died while the movie was being made. And Leo told us that his cousin told him in a phone call conversation that although he was glad to have his story being told, it was killing him because he just hadn't wanted to go back and, and do that. So that was kind of a touchstone for Leo yeah. to validate his own feelings about, you know, what's the good? I want to tell the world. It's important that we document this because there's all kinds of, uh, you know, the Ukraine war is, uh, uh, as, as you know now, is a big yeah. deal. And when I see pictures of the Ukraine war, and if, if um, some of your uh, listeners and, uh, and, and readers or whatever it is, that when they come to see the movie, they'll see historic images from World War II with the Nazis, you know, coming in and just destroying these parts of Poland that look like watching the daily news today with what's going on yeah. in Ukraine. Yeah, so absolutely. you've got, I mean, you, you want to try to learn from history and, um, and he had never had a personal trust with somebody before me and then Brenda and David with whom to share his, uh, who he felt would honestly share his story. And I, this isn't, my, uh, I'm saying it, but it's the words of his family who were very happy that he opened up to us and who said that he had never um, uh, before opened up before. And while we were filming him, from time to time, he would break down. We'd have to, you know, stop the cameras. We don't want to, we don't want to exploit this, but I mean, he would break down and he couldn't take it. We'd have to take a half hour break and then he could go on uh, telling his story. So it was painful for him. But as documentarians, uh, we're very, very happy uh, that, uh, that we're able to bring his story, not just to this generation, to our generation, but it's, it's a record. It's a permanent record of what happened because there's still lots of uh, wingnuts out there that are basically yeah. saying none of this ever happened. Oh, yeah. And we, we met his sister when we filmed her. She was 105 years old. Yeah. You know, we got their stories down while they were still alive. While he was composing the, the Rhapsody during that period of time when he was incarcerated, it was a cathartic uh, a period for him, a cathartic experience for him. Do you think that reliving it would have been as well while he was putting together this album, which became a documentary? Did he experience the same thing, do you feel? 
rather than me, I, I try not to uh, not to uh, speak about what I think Leo might have felt, but right. he did tell us uh, in the making of the film. He said, uh, you know, telling my story uh, is good for me and makes me feel good, but it's also very bad for me and very hurtful to me. So he felt it was a mixed bag and he felt that the, um, his, uh, in a way, his liberation, his ultimate liberation that he could tell the story for, in his words, humanity, so that others could maybe not repeat the same mistakes, um, was an important uh, emancipation and a liberation in some ways, uh, even more important than the physical liberation when uh, the Russians came in and, uh, and freed his town from the Nazis and he, and, and, and he knew that he would live. Because when he was writing his diary, we haven't spoken of his diary, but when he was writing his, his daily diary for 180 days, it's about almost 200 pages long, yeah. Um, every day, he expected that he could be killed by the next day. And there were but some times what, where he almost was. There were indeed. There were, it was it was very close. And when we filmed Leo, when we filmed Leo doing his uh, his uh, uh, testimony of what he saw, what he experienced, uh, uh, and and when I finished the recording. And when we ended up having a great concert at the Ashkenaz uh, Festival in Toronto at Harborfront, which was sold out, the media jumped on it, and uh, he got seven standing ovations. And uh, we thought, okay, the, the movie's over. You know, the guy lost his work, got resuscitated. We had a, 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 a successful uh, CD. There was a concert. He was acknowledged in his lifetime by all of that. And then three months later, just before he turned 100, uh, he died. He was an old guy. It wasn't to say, oh, my God, how could he die? What a big surprise. But it, 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 we kind of were surprised because, I mean, he ha hadn't been uh, very ill uh, during it. After he died, the family said, uh, please come into uh, our dad's house Um before we sell the house and probably throw out everything that's there, you guys might find something that's good for your documentary. And rummaging through an old sock drawer hmm. of uh, his son, Les, uh, who was then probably 60 or 65 years old, um, uh, we found uh, these pages in a tiny little book that we couldn't read because it was, we assumed in Polish, and, uh, and we didn't know what it was, and, and, we, and we thought maybe it's a diary or something. So uh, we sent down some scans to the Holocaust Museum. They wrote us back a letter saying that these are, in fact, secret diaries that would have been thrown out, and that had we not been making the movie, would never have seen the light of day, that are among the most important documents from World War II, right up there with Anne Frank's diary because they're first person eyewitness accounts on a daily basis yeah. of what was going on. And that's pretty rare. And, and in some so, cases, the people that he mentions in the diary, he has to use code names for them because he's afraid that these, this diary is going to fall into the wrong hands and is going to implicate some of his friends. Exactly. So what we found out Subsequently, as we uh, took us a couple of years to find someone who could translate them, it's not just translate them, but they're all smudged. Every time he yeah. snuck out of his hiding place to get food or I don't know what he had to do to, to survive, uh, he would tape these handwritten diaries under his shirt. And sometimes it was raining because he never knew if he could go back to his hiding place or maybe the Nazis would have found it and then he couldn't do it. So uh, they had to be computer enhanced and uh, we found a fantastic uh, uh, translator uh, in Austria, uh, an academic, Hanya Fedorowicz, who became an associate producer of our uh, document and she was uh, fluent in, uh, in uh, 
all the languages that she needed to be fluent, Polish, Yiddish, Ukrainian, Russian, English, and so forth. And um, so uh, once we had the diaries, the question is, so how do we finish the documentary? Uh, it took Hannah, Hanya two years to send us weekly installments of her translations. And we would be waiting with bated breath, like it, like I, I thought of uh, England when uh, Dickens was writing his serialized novels. And every Sunday in the paper, they would uh, do another chapter. We were waiting with bated breath for the next chapter of his diaries. We knew he survived, you know, <laughs> but he didn't know he was going to survive. Anyway, um, when we finally got it, we realized that the key stories that he had told us during our interviews while he was alive were all in the diaries and they were word for word what he had told us on screen. This was really a, a changing, a trajectory changing incident for us as filmmakers because when he told us his stories, he was 99 years old and one can't help but think maybe one, maybe he misremembers, maybe he's exaggerating. Uh, and once we had the diaries, we had to figure out how to make a film with the actual words from the diary and the words 75 years later when he got in front of a camera. We would mentioned that your, your son David has directed this, this fantastic film. His use of... of as a graphic novel style in depicting some of the pictures, which is, which is a kind of a form of animation, as, as you mentioned, mixed in with, with archival footage and the interviews done with family and friends and the, the sessions of uh, performing and, and rehearsing with the orchestra. That combination works extremely well and, and makes for a very riveting, riveting documentary, riveting film. That, that, as I mentioned, you, you can't stop watching once you, once you start because there's so many different kinds of experiences that you, that you, that, that you go through while watching this. It, it's hard to get that right. Uh, first of all, uh, David is fantastic. He's a fantastic, uh, in particular, uh, um, documentarian and uh, producer and director of music-oriented stuff. He used to play in a band group in a musical family you know, lighthouse and all that stuff around that, our house. And, mm -hmm. and our, um, my wife, Brenda writes lyrics for Hollywood movies and we're all in the, in the kind of business, but, um, he has a hobby that he's had since he was a little kid of collecting comic books. Yeah. And, uh, so I don't know what it is today. It was at one point 20 or 30,000 comic books that he, that he, that, uh, are in his collection. And he always liked graphic novels, and he's also a very good artist. He paints, he's an oil painter, and uh, does realistic scenes. Um, uh, and um, when we started to, uh, to think about how we might be able to get an animator to, um, uh, to animate the sections of the diary, um, and, uh, and he basically... Uh, uh, validated our thought that if you want to get animation, you got to get a quote from an animation company. And in order to do that, you need to make what we call storyboards in the mm -hmm. film business, which are like little illustrations of what it is so that the animation com company can know like how much time, what's the, you know, how much work it is for them. What do you want done? So David started doing illustrations as storyboards for the animation. And, uh, because our film was made differently than uh, most films of this nature of the length and the production value have maybe 100, 200 people working on them. And the three of us uh, took us a long time, but we did almost everything ourselves. We had about six other people who were cameramen and some men who occasionally would come and do some stuff. So David started doing these um, illustrations and every time we had a, ran out of money, which was frequently, uh, and we had to raise some more money, we would do uh, some excerpts from the film in progress, and we would use David's illustrations uh, with a little caveat at the beginning of the clip saying, this is just temporary until we get the animation done. And I guess after a couple of years, 
every single time we went to a money raiser, they say, by the way, those illustrations are really terrific. You know, who did them? So we came to a crossroads and uh, we said to David, are you up to actually doing all of the illustrations? And he said, uh, yeah, that would be fun. So David has done 200 illustrations and taught himself how to do rudimentary animation. And that's it. So this is really, it's not quite Judy Garland and the, and uh, what's the, uh, the other guy, the short guy. <laughs> let's you know, let's build the Hollywood a stage. Thing. And, yeah, yeah. Right. Let's build a stage in a garage. Yeah. Um, because we're much more sophisticated uh, uh, people in the industry. But we did most of it uh, kind of on our own. And the animation has had uh, fantastic reviews. And there are companies interested in either publishing it as a graphic novel or... Uh, or, um, you know, uh, uh, making a, a, an ancillary uh, art show of his, uh, of his drawings. Well, I could see that. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very compelling way of, 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 of illustration. It's, it's something that's, that, that's, I don't think I've ever seen it used in a documentary before. And my, my son is a big fan of graphic novels, but I don't think I've ever seen it used in a documentary. And when I first saw it, I thought, well, isn't that interesting? And I thought, wow, is that ever powerful? And I'm wondering whether that's going to be continued down the line by other documentarians and other producers and directors. Uh, I imagine it may be. As right. a matter of fact, uh, uh, I don't know if this is up to David, but uh, he's up for, uh, he's starting to get, I mean, uh, we just, uh, the premiere is in two days. It's Wednesday evening mm -hmm. at 7.30 at the uh, Hot Doc Cinema in Toronto. But, uh, uh, for sure, that we've had uh, uh, lots of lots of interest in um, in uh, David pursuing that, and also in David doing work for uh, for other movies. Uh, somebody was mentioning that they uh, had a connection to um, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, who's doing uh, a new uh, a new movie, and the fact that he may be using um, some um, graphic novel type of uh, animation mm -hmm. in it, so we don't know what that is, but uh, who knows? We should point out that um, that you will be able to stream online the Rhapsody 1939-1945 beginning on the 16th of June right through to the 26th. Is it your hope that uh, this will become available in, in, in theaters or perhaps a television a network or station could could pick it up so that you can have a wider, wider audience for this? Uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and maybe make back one tenth of what you paid oh yeah no we're not worried about it. this is this yeah. is not a, a, a the, the making back is not is not I an know. issue uh, uh for us we did this because uh because we got uh it, it changed our lives we got a passion to make sure that leo's story was going to be told and that's what's been driving us to empty our bank account and do all that kind of stuff that, that one has to do when you make a a, a documentary but um, I think the, uh, the important, um, the most important objective for us uh, became uh, taking this fascinating, uh, riveting, to use your word, thank you, story, and to make it as widely as available as possible because uh, today there are still Lots of people that, that say, uh, you know, this is just made up stories. These things never happened. Yeah. They were exaggerated. And, um, and it's not just a story. It's not really, it's not just a Jewish story. Because, of course, even in Poland, it wasn't just the Jews that were persecuted. It was the liberals, the, the, uh, um, the people of color. Uh, it was the artists. It was on and on and on. But... Um, you know, it's this uh, people who are others, this fear of others that's been growing over the last uh, couple of decades, um, that anybody who doesn't fit your sexual orientation or uh, your immigrant status, where you come from, are somehow a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it became very important to us and remains important that we uh, make the story uh, as widely available as possible. So we certainly hope that it will get uh, a theatrical distribution and, uh, and television distribution and graphic novel distribution. Yeah. And in, in uh, schools and stuff, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be 
uh, happy to uh, make different versions of it available for um, uh, young people of different ages that are more suitable uh, uh, for them so that the story can be uh, available. It's important. It's very important, and, and I hope it happens. It, it clearly, this project has had a, had a, had a, has had a, a profound effect on you and for anybody who has an opportunity to watch it, it, it will on them as well. I can, I can promise you that. Paul, I, w- I want to thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us again. I truly enjoyed it. It is a riveting documentary. Congratulations to you and, and to your wife and your son. And, and I think I saw about three or four other Hoffert names bouncing around the credits at the end there. So I think you managed to get just about everybody in the family. And, uh, it, it, it's, it's a great piece. Thanks so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Ted. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.